So a big thank you for everyone who is here in the room in Gothenburg at the Lindholmen Conference Center and everyone who is attending online. I'm sure uh, there will be more people joining as the minutes pass online, but I think we're all here now in the room. A big thank you to everyone. It's great to see you here. We have a very interesting program ahead of us, the Quantum Autumn School 2023. It's the first time we do it in this format with this level of ambition. It's the first time there will be future iterations in, in coming years. So let's see, there might be rough edges. I'm hoping there will be very few rough edges. My name is Tor Wikfeldt. I work at the ENCCS Center in Stockholm. Uh, we are the EuroCC National Competence Center in High Performance Computing. We are the hosts of this event, but we're working together with VACT, the Wallenberg uh, Center for Quantum Technologies, and uh, NordicQuest, the Nordic Quantum Computing Project. I will be your host. I will be around for all these three days. I will introduce the speakers uh, as, as we go. So I will now hand over to Jöran. Welcome to a really pioneering event, I could say. We had a, a something a little bit similar a year ago or ha one and a half years ago at Chalmers, but this this is a whole new dimension and I think it will be a, a, a roadmap, provide a roadmap for, for, for Sweden and the Nordic countries. Uh, so my name is Joram Vendin. I'm a partner of, of the VACT, uh, part of the VACT uh, Wallenberg uh, project to build a quantum computer in, in Sweden. And it was conceived in 2018 and uh, was meant for 10 years, but actually it's been successful to the extent that it's now 12 years, ending 2029. Uh, and the idea is eventually to build a hundred 100 qubit computer. Uh, of course, in the perspective of uh, the uh, on the continent and America and so on, one is building 1,000 qubits aiming for that at the same time. Um, the, the, the VAC goal may look a bit uh, small, but on the other hand, you have to know that at this moment, it's very hard to build coherent quantum computers with even 20 qubits. So even if the numbers look very large, what other people are doing or aiming for, uh, uh, it, it's a long road. And, and uh, uh, the number of qubits is really not the important thing. It's the quality of what you can do with it. So um, I think VACT is on a good road and uh, will actually be very well integrated in the international efforts eventually. Uh, there will be a lot of things learning, and we actually have to proceed by rather small steps all the time. So at the moment, uh, VACT is really working on a 20 qubit, 25 qubit, really good process at this time. And this is sort of what the, the international standard is now, to be able to do something really good at the 25 qubit level. So uh, that's what we have to look forward for. So let me just then start talking to you about uh, the presentation I would like to give you. So I would like to give you an overview of different quantum computing hardware approaches and uh, QC types of computing. One of the most important um, um, concepts I would like to tell you, or, or uh, take a note of it, information is physical. When using your brains and thinking about things and you're sending your opinions here and there, et cetera, you have a feel, some people have a feeling that it doesn't take energy and, and is somehow esoteric of some sort. Uh, I mean, to the point of view that some people even think that you can transfer thoughts between brains, et cetera. The, 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 uh, I mean, uh, without uh, real transmissions. So, uh, the point is information is physical, very physical. A bit takes energy. And to throw away information takes energy. Erasing me uh, computer memory takes energy. So Maxwell's demon gets hot. So therefore, it, uh, it takes a lot of energy to do computing. And let me then explain now what a quantum computer is uh, in relation to a classical computer. This uh, slide you see is very packed. Much of my uh, presentation is 
meant for you to be able to go back to and actually look at later and, and, and see the details. For now, I will only emphasize that this microprocessor, the quantum uh, a, a, uh, information processor, uh, has two types now. One is the classical one uh, with logically reversible gates. Uh, it cannot be run backwards. And uh, it's classical devices. And the important thing is that the levels, the logical levels are sort of voltages or currents or something, something similar. Uh, it's basically built on switches between two classical levels, right? Now, a, a microprocessor that goes for quantum is logically reversible. Uh, the gates are both ways, so you can actually run it forwards and backwards. You can sort of backtrack a, 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 a reversible computer. They can be classical, actually, but in print the, the, uh, these days, I mean, we are really only talking about quantum computers, really, when it comes to logical reversible computers. And there, the levels are quantum. That is, they are built on uh, quantum systems, uh, like atoms, for instance, which have, dif which have uh, different uh, energy levels. And those are the ones one is using. Typically, one is focusing on, two, on the two lowest level, called zero and one, and you can flip between them. So what sort of uh, physical devices are uh, used for? Uh, quantum computers. Well, you see them listed here. Uh, the superconduct, super when you talk about superconducting architectures, you often see this uh, uh, fridge device, the, the uh, fridge, the, the cooler, uh, which is, of course, not really relevant because uh, the quantum computer is sitting here as completely invisible almost. Uh, I'll, here's a grid of of, of qubits, and I'll show you a little bit better in, in a little while what that is. Now, ion trap architectures uh, trap in, 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 a, in a trap, a uh, radio frequency trap, they trap atoms, a chain of atoms, a row, which are interacting with themselves and with lasers, uh, picking them out and, and uh, controlling and reading. Uh, the neutral atom architectures uh, consist of a, of a lat by lasers you form a, a lattice where you trap atoms and neutral atoms. And then by other lasers, you run through here and you pick out various, um, you control these uh, atoms in various ways by, by this rather intricate laser system. When it comes to semiconductor architecture, there are a number of alternatives. Uh, one is uh, um, vacancies in, in lattices, like in diamond, for instance, these uh, so-called envy centers. Uh, and I should say, when it comes to semiconductors, it's mainly what we call spin qubits. The electron, as you know, have a spin. And if you put an electron in a, in a magnetic field, then um, it develops two levels. It's either spin up or spin down in that, uh, in that field. Uh, this can now be generalized to all sorts of systems uh, with efficient, effective spins. So in these semiconductor devices, you should see here, there is an effective spin all the way, here in the vacancy or in an actual uh, implanted um, impurity or in, in, uh, or in um, this, how shall I say, uh, elect electrode uh, arrangements in a semiconductor electron gas or electron systems of a semiconductor, you can actually pick out uh, and form quantum dots in these systems. And there you can form these kind of spin systems also that can be operated then. Uh, and then finally, photonic architecture, um, photons are having uh, First of all, photons are sort of flying qubits. They don't sit in a place, they're moving. Uh, they're being sent around in, in fibers, for instance, or put in resonators, in, in, in cavities. And uh, they have, photons have polarization, spin, if you like, uh, and it can be pointed in sort of vertical, horizontal, in various, so you can, you can pick out different uh, orthogonal directions of, of that, and they can then form the up, down, or, or 
zero one levels, etc. Uh, to give you one little insight into what a superconducting quantum bit is, uh, uh, to start uh, on the classical level, you know, uh, you know, on a vibrating string, you have these sort of this is a piano string, for instance, and these are the modes you see on the string. That was a classical thing, but then if you go. The point is, of course, that if you go down here, right, uh, you can actually build. Uh, sorry, I'm flipping around here. I want to be here. Um, the corresponding thing, electrical thing, is a is an LC oscillator uh, with the, with an inductance and a capacitance. Uh, and there, uh, you always in that resonator, you can set up these oscillations and these modes. Uh, so if you look at what the levels are. Um, most of you are not used to, to, to this maybe, but if you cool down an electric oscillator that you have for radio uh, purpose or something, if it's good enough, uh, when you get down to the bottom of the energy, uh, you find that it splits up into energy levels. You can actually see the energy levels. So that's the big new thing about uh, these kind of electrical oscillators in, in nanotechnology and quantum electrodynamics, you, you can actually look at the separate quantum states of such an oscillator. Uh, and that's how, how the, tran the transmon, the, the superconducting qubit, the, the most popular one is being used. Uh, because there you replace the inductance by a Josephson junction. And that Josephson junction turns out to be a non-linear uh, inductance. And what happens then is that this harmonic um, harmonic potential that gives you equal distance between the energy levels uh, uh, is becoming what you say, unharmonic, non-linear. So it means that the distance between the energy levels uh, becomes different and that makes it possible when you have sharp, uh, well-defined um, uh, radiation, microwave radiation to excite with, that you can select. The micro, it's a precision. You can actually excite this transition rather than this transition. And that means you can actually use these levels as qubits. This would not be possible up here because if you excite here, you just excite the whole thing and just make the oscillate vibrate with large amplitudes. Down here, you can actually stay down at the bottom of the potential. And so these are the qubits that uh, the transmon, the superconducting transmon is using. So now let's get back from technicalities to more general views. Uh, I would say Moore's law is not dead uh, because uh, the hardware um, development and, and the speed of the uh, of the clock frequency and so on have stalled. But instead, you parallelize enormously. You, so you try to almost to parallelize in an exponential way. Actually, that what you would have to do in order to to actually meet the uh, future's needs. Uh, so. Uh, what exponential scaling means is you, this uh, famous uh, uh, thing about putting grains on a chessboard and uh, sort of doubling every for every uh, square uh, sounds doesn't sound very much, but in the end it, it sort of becomes a mountain uh, on that chessboard. Uh, so Morse law now actually describes exponential scaling of computer performance via parallelization. Uh, and currently, the uh, leading HPCs employ about more than 10 million cores. I mean, in, in your computers, you may have all eight cores or something, or even maybe 32 now, but the bigger stuff has up to 10 billion, 10 million cores. But this uh, implies exponential scaling with electric power because I told you that uh, I emphasized that, uh, um, that information is physical. So uh, it means that uh, these uh, very large uh, computer servers, uh, they need their own power stations and they have been placed in the right places where there's both energy and cooling. And 
the point is this becomes a real problem because now in the discussions of using high performance computing uh, in the world and in Europe, uh, we are really talking about uh, how to uh, limit these energy consumption because it becomes, uh, it's becoming a problem. And therefore in principle, it would be good to have uh, computer methods that actually scales exponentially uh, and there the quantum computer might be something. At least uh, one of the motivations for using quantum computers is that since, since they in principle can uh, uh, provide exponential advantage, uh, it means that they would be able to solve the same uh, hard problems with much, much less energy and in much le uh, less time. So uh, to give an example of um, what we're talking about, if you want to solve a, a uh, if you want to solve a quantum chemistry problem, uh, then um, the time to solution for a for a high performance computer grows exponentially with classical compute, uh, classical quantum chemistry programs like this. However, uh, with a uh, quantum computer in principle this uh, the, the time to solution might scale linear ne linearly instead or perhaps polynomially but not exponentially so uh, somewhere there is a crossover and uh, at for large enough sizes uh, the there will be quantum advantage or at least that is what can be happen formally, can happen formally. Uh, and it remains to actually achieve that uh, in real life. So the original killer application was already in the Shor's algorithm for factorization, as you know, in 95. Uh, and that is really what uh, started the, the race because especially military and, uh, and authorities uh, don't want their secrets to be uh, um, able to harvest uh, by other people in, in, in a long time. And it's not a question of real time, it's a question of being able to guard your secret about 50 years or something like that. So that's why uh, the, uh, the possible avail availability of quantum computers that can break codes, uh, like let's say 25 years from now, uh, is still important. It's not a question of breaking codes now, but to actually to reveal uh, the secrets of databases 50 years from now. Uh, so today the typical killer application are, are, are then not uh, this short algorithm in practice, but what we want to do right now, namely use cases, quantum chemistry, uh, material science, and optimization. And what you see here is then optimization wise is, is uh, uh, let's see if I can get the course here. Uh, here, uh, the flight pattern of of, uh, of of the flight patterns on on Earth, and and here is uh, what you would like the, the 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 active part, enzyme part of an enzyme able to split uh, to 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 split the uh, uh, essential. Uh, uh, chemical reactions to 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 bind the nitrogen, for instance. To to uh, and all these things are really very important problems. Uh, and uh, the question is, what can we do about it in any limited time? So let's see what time it is. Okay. Uh, so complexity classes are very important for in this business. So uh, high performance computers like classic computers, today's computers are efficient. I mean, they, yeah, in, uh, in, in uh, the class called P, it's polynomial. In other words, uh, uh, the solutions of the problem uh, can be done in polynomial time. It doesn't go exponential, right? It's from linear a little bit up. Uh, but then there is something called quantum, bounded error quantum polynomial. That's those class of problem where the quantum computer uh, is providing linear solutions while the classical ones uh, go exponential. And then there is uh, another one, quantum Merlin Arthur, uh, uh, 
I'm not going to describe this in any sort of detail, but it's good to know the names. The QMA uh, is then a class which is even hard for quantum computers. So uh, you have to realize that there are problems that are simple for quantum computers, so to say, and even hard for quantum computers. So in the end, uh, most of the problems that we are really interested in in human life for, uh, are hard for anything, for any computer, even quantum computers. So uh, this is something for you to look in a little detail later and so on. I, I will only sort of emphasize here that, let's find, there's the, here. Uh, the polynomial class is here, and it's that really the central part. That's where every class C computer is now, right? And then you have this sort of NP class, uh, non-deterministic polynomial, uh, non-deterministic Turing machine, which uh, then represents hard problems for classical computers. And, and it goes all the way up to very, very hard problems uh, that takes take basically forever to solve. And then, but then if you go back to the polynomial here, and then you, you can go out then into the quantum regime, uh, and then you get into the regime which is simple for quantum computers, uh, sort of polynomial for quantum computers, mm -hmm. but uh, and that's where sure algorithm for factorization is. And also uh, like the quantum QA, some of the routines and, and what you will be discussing later, uh, tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera, will belong to this region. But then also there are problems that are then bordering to what is hard for quantum computers, et cetera. And actually quantum chemistry is here really on this border. So, uh, and you, this will be discussed a lot more, but uh, I sort of want to emphasize that quantum computers are very good and interesting, but many problems which a quantum can, computer can do much better than a classical computer are nevertheless pretty hard for a quantum computer. So this is the one of, here at least again this is for you to look into detail later if you have the time but i want to emphasize down here uh, one particular thing namely a schrodinger wave equation um, i mean for us this is i want to emphasize that the schrodinger wave equation describing quantum matter uh, looks very similar to to to, to the Maxwell equation or, or, or equations describing vibrations in, in, in classical systems. So you can always think about it in the same time, in the same way. So what I would like to emphasize here, that if you build a quantum register of, of qubits, like you sort of see here, you can think of it in terms of a wave pattern. Here's a wave pattern on a surface of water. And, and you can say that this pattern represents the state of something. Uh, it is a response to raindrops falling uh, on a water. And therefore this pattern tells you something about the information in the rain that came down there in principle, right? Uh, and then uh, in this middle figure here shows uh, the, the a number of iron atoms on, on a copper surface. And it, you can actually see that there is a wave pattern in the, electron, uh, in the electron structure on that thing. So it means that for me, uh, what I want to emphasize here is that if you create a, a, a register with qubits, which are represent as spins here, it means that that register is somehow a, a setup of, of spin waves in, in a quantum system. And it can be treated and regarded in the same way as you actually look upon raindrops on a, on, on a water surface. And the quantum computing uh, in, the, in the quantum register corresponds a bit to actually dropping drop, water drops on a water surface, look at the interference patterns, and from that on draw conclusions about uh, what has been happening. So, right. And technically speaking, this register here uh, can be regarded as a, uh, if you think about, about it as a classical um, register, 
then it would be, and this, uh, this spins here, a simple bit, zero or one, nothing else, zero or one. Then you could, this uh, configuration here could be just zeros, or zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, up to one, one, one. That would mean you have two to the end uh, configurations of this memory. The problem is that class or, or classically, you can only have one of these at the same time. However, uh, in a quantum register, uh, you can actually have them all together. So, so you can, by manipulating, by, by inputs to this uh, surface, you can put this thing into a superposition of all configurations at the same time. Uh, this will be uh, mentioned many times over again, etc. But I just want to inter introduce you to the totality of it. So the idea of being able to put all of this into a, just a big superposition uh, is called superposition and entanglement. Uh, and this is the final difficult slide for you. Again, for you uh, who have a little bit of inclination to look at these things, uh, it can be revealing. Uh, so, so a computer, a classical, any, any computer is, is, is constructed from a memory, right? And you operate on that memory to, to uh, change it. So, and so here is the memory at one time, and here's the memory at the next time. And it, the, 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 the configurations in the memory uh, is connected by various gates you operate on. So in a quantum computer, you then, uh, in a quantum computer, you actually compute in memory. So you don't have a lot of uh, logic. You don't sort of uh, pick information out of the memory. You operate it somewhere else and you put it back into the memory. You're actually doing all the operations right into the same memory all the time. Uh, so initially, the, the memory then is, let's say, uh, some sort of... Uh, uh, in a quantum computer, you you put a, a, a you can either start it in in a let's see what the cursor is. Uh, in, in a quantum computer, you can either start the computation in in any of these states or in a superposition of all these things. But then, when you operate with all these gates, one on the one qubit, two qubits, three qubits, uh, you can create a new superposition of all these memory configurations with, with general coefficients. Actually, the computation you're doing uh, is by actually controlling these parameters in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the register. Now, now that's done, that is, the, uh, that is done by algorithms and, and, and the, the values of these things reflect what is being done by the algorithm. And in the end, you have to measure these, uh, these uh, coefficients in order to get the result. Now that's a whole different thing and it's a tough thing, but these are the basics for how you actually, this is the basics for what you can do with a quantum computer. And then uh, the way this, the gates are being done, that can be written generally in terms of uh, a, a transfer operator from one memory time to another that is called the time evolution operator. Now this is a quantum, ex quantum thing, uh, but technically speaking, it's similarly in an ordinary classical computer, you have these transfer functions between, uh, between memory states that is done by the algorithm. Anyway, Okay, so now come uh, a few uh, concluding simpler pictures. Uh, so when it comes to high perform HPC plus QC hybrid computing, this is the name of the game these days. Uh, how to connect uh, uh, quantum computers with high performance computing. Or rather, uh, it depends a bit on who you are. Um, if you are a quantum physicist, uh, up to pretty recently, they, they, we didn't care much about high performance computing. I mean, uh, people were happy to actually uh, 
do the create a quantum computer and do the best they could with that. Uh, however, uh, the name of the game is high performance computing. Uh, uh, so therefore, combination of uh, the people from the high performance side, high performance computing, they insist on that quantum computers have to be integrated with, quant with a high performance computer in order to do anything useful. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, we these days talk about uh, high performance HPC centric computers, uh, which is sort of where the high performance, uh, where the quantum computer is, is, is uh, an accelerator of the classical machine. While uh, we at the quantum computer side maybe talk more about quantum centric, where the H HPC machine is more of a service for us. Uh, and that you'll see here very clearly. Uh, this little lady, when she um, wants to ask, do some computation, she just sends a program to a classical computer. Now, this could be a high performance computer, or it could be just a, a small machine uh, sort of connecting to a quantum computer. And the quantum computer then, uh, and, and the question, and they are connected, the classic machine and the quantum machine are connected by high-speed optical links. But the division between the two is, is floating. How much, who is doing what? Um, now, a, a very good, especially a future quantum computer, it, it really needs a lot of classical computing sitting very, very close to it in, its, what, you, in what you call its stack. Uh, so a, a quantum computer is not just a, a, a bit of class, a lot of quantum operations and quantum hardware, but it has a lot of classical um, uh, hardware and software to, to run it and to control it. Uh, so it needs FPGAs, classically controlled, uh, super fast uh, processing, and uh, and also in um, in Already now, and especially in the near future, there will be a lot of error mitigation and error correction. And for that, you have to have very fast connection between, uh, I mean, you have to do it in real time. Basically, you, you have to do error correction in real time. Uh, and that means that the, uh, the classical and uh, quantum computer must, no, the classical software and hardware must be integrated with the Compute with the classical one. Uh, now the HPC people uh, feel that they can do that from over here, while uh, I dare say that uh, uh, we in the quantum community emphasize uh, that uh, this is the the, the uh, important classical solution for for running the the algorithms must be very very close to the quantum computer, and that the HPC systems will be more of a service uh, on a high level with uh, well preparing uh, uh, complicated algorithms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and so, in future, it's be it's going to be a very very important development on how these systems collaborate, uh, and that is a major. Uh, research problem. And, and that can only be done what's happening right now, namely that these things are being tried and tested at various levels. So among the, a few more slides and I'll be done. Uh, this is a Nordic Quest uh, layout. This is the, uh, down here you see, and, and you, will be, uh, you will be touching upon that and be taught about that a lot in this, in this uh, workshop. Uh, in this school, because at Chalmers, we have this Qual 9000 quantum processing unit. And in Finland, in Helsinki, we have Helmi. Helmi. Uh, and, and up, and up in, in Kayane, uh, we have the Lumi uh, high performance computer. And, and the Puhuri uh, is a basically a software, I would say located even somewhere else, but is uh, is a service program that allows you to send your 
you communicate and send your your job to uh, to an interface that is a not request interface that calls allows you to work with Qiskit and prepare programs and then send them down to Qua 9000 or Helmi and also to other simulators and things like that you might want to know, want to use. Uh, so this is the uh, really layout of, of, an, of the HPC QC installation that, uh, uh, that we will actually illustrate quite a bit more during this school. Uh, where you can be able to use, well, you will be able to use, for instance, Qiskit by Jupyter Notebooks to, to contact these computers here. At this time, you won't go through uh, the, uh, uh, you won't go through the, uh, the no request system, right? It's not ready yet, but uh, you will see part of it. Uh, and to round off now, uh, the future of competitive quantum computing is, to, in my view, to have a thousand perfect qubits with infinite coherence times. So you can do millions to billions of CNOS gates uh, and can spend any time on it. I mean, uh, any time. It means that uh, if a quantum computer ca can needs this sort of time, minutes, hours, days, uh, it means that a classical computer would need much, much more for that. Uh, so what is possible today is in these noise intermediate scale quantum devices is uh, uh, we often use uh, what is called quantum volume uh, to describe this, to, to, to sort of a metric to characterize it. Uh, and uh, it says that uh, the quantum volume is two to the n, where n is the number of qubits in time that can be entangled, uh, let's say, in one single shot. That is what you need in order to do real quantum computing. Uh, uh, in other words, you can just with one uh, operation within the coherence time, you entangle a, 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 a number of qubits. And IBM can currently only entangle nine qubits uh, in one shot. Uh, and still they are, work, they are designing computers with 100 to 400 to 1,000 qubits. The continuum iron trap can currently be entangled 19 qubits. Now, so that, that quantum volume is suddenly enormous. It looks very impressive. Uh, uh, but the, the, what you should need to understand is that it just describes two to, the, two to the n. That is the number of qubits that can be entangled. Now, to entangle 19 qubits in one shot is, of course, not bad. But what you have to do is to be able to entangle about 100 qubits, bang, in one shot. And then to be able to use that for running a number of uh, circuits and, 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 uh, in an algorithm. And that's still another thing. I'll leave that slide for you to, to uh, look at later. It's just a little bit of information about uh, uh, quantum simulation and a few articles. Uh, Let me repeat that this is the, the roadmap of, of uh, uh, IBM. And, and they do have actually done something very interesting work here at currently with 127 qubits. They have done something really impressive in, in, in uh, uh, using 127 qubits for, for a quantum computation with error mitigation that really uh, has broken the ice uh, for some, uh, for some uh, description of, of uh, material science. Uh, and they are now working on 433 qubits, etc. But I have to say though, that these to work out here, right, uh, uh, we're still working with very incoherent devices. So, so what is what it means for quantum computing and, and to beat quant classical high performance computer over here is really written in the cloud right now. And let's see now, yeah. Uh, Final slide. Uh, so in here, you find information about this uh, uh, recent uh, IBM experiment that uh, I think it's worthwhile really to take a look at if you want to see what, what can be done. This does not uh, deal with uh, algorithms or, or doing some sort of computation that uh, it's more like simulation of material science uh, of, of the 
of the magnetization of, of the quantum computer sample and things like that. But so it's basically going back to uh, simulating and describing experimenting with physics. Uh, but uh, so so we will have to proceed on parallel uh, ways in the future and. and uh, and, and use the quantum computers and the services to the society in, in, in uh, parallel ways. Uh, it, we have to do it all together. Okay, uh, that's the end of my presentation and I'm open for any questions or comments and I'll be around during the, uh, in this way, uh, the, the entire, uh, all the days so we can talk later also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jöran. That was very interesting. I want to bring everyone's attention to the following fact. Okay, so on the HackMD page, there's a link to the training material. And there you will find Joran's slides and you will find all the slides for all the presenters here. And you will also find the exercises and everything is organized here in chronological order on the left. So physical approaches to quantum computing, here you will find Joran's slides. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question from the audience? If not, I would like to introduce Anton Frisk Kokum. Okay. Uh, so my name is Anton Frisk Kokum. I also work with Jöran in this Wallenberg Center for Quantum Technology as a senior researcher, working mostly on the theory side for so how to model these quantum computers that we are building, and also a bit on like what programs should be run on them. And what I'm going to present today is sort of a very basic introduction to uh, the fundamental building blocks of quantum computation. So the things you will see when you later today and uh, the next few days here explore how to program quantum computers. So I will, what I will not talk about is now sort of different physical implementations of this. I will talk about now more quantum bits and gates in more abstract way, not bothering with how do we now implement them in some ion traps or superconducting qubits or whatever that Jöran mentioned. But just sort of what, what is the really structure of quantum computing. And this is the outline. I will, yeah, we'll first look at the quantum circuits or a quantum algorithm. What, what are the components there? Then we'll go into quantum bits and uh, gates you can do on bit, quantum bits, single qubit gates, multi qubit gates. And then sort of what is needed to make this a universal gate set, uh, something that can implement any algorithm. Uh, we'll then talk a bit about something called the solovey kitayev theorem and a bit also about how to compile quantum algorithms. So when you see a quantum algorithm uh, discussed or written about, you will, you will see some circuit like this. We call this a quantum circuit. Uh, and this shows sort of the four uh, things we need to do a quantum computation. First of all, we need some way to represent our data. We need some quantum bits. So in a diagram like this, we have time going from left to right. And each line here is representing one quantum bit. So this line is a quantum bit traveling through time. This next line is another quantum bit tra traveling through time. Next, we need some way to initialize our uh, computation. So we assume we have some way to prepare the initial state. And here we've written out the initial state of each qubit. They are each initialized in the state zero. Then we will do the computation itself. And this is done by applying quantum gates or logical gate operations on the qubits. Uh, and the gates, the, this box here represents a gate called the Hadamard gate. This line connecting two qubits is another gate acting on two qubits and, and so on. So this qubit starts in state zero and then one this H gate is applied and then after that uh, this two qubit gate is applied and so on. And at the end when we've done our computation uh, we need to read out the results. So at the end here, uh, some measurement happens and we, we check what is the state of the qubit at the end here. 
Now, uh, in this talk, I will focus on, on two parts here. First, what is a quantum hit, and then how do we do these, uh, or what are these gates we can do? So to assume, okay, we have some device, they can initialize it in some states, and we can read out the result. We don't need to get into the details of that, basically. So, what's a quantum bit? Well, and I will say qubit from now on, because that's the short word to use. Uh, it saves a lot of time. So unlike, unlike a normal classical bit, a bit in, in uh, classical computers, a qubit can be in a supposition of states. And what I mean by that is we can write the general state, I call this psi here. Uh, we can write it as it's not just going to be zero or just going to be one, but it's somehow going to contain both components uh, and they will have some coefficients here, alpha, beta, they are complex coefficients whose, uh, and the norm, so the, the sum of the uh, amplitude square here sums to one. I will sh say why in a moment. Um, this is really all linear algebra that we're doing now. You, you don't really need to think about quantum physics as such, you can think of all this as uh, vectors. So we have two possible states, zero and one, and uh, this is uh, like the zero state is one basis vector, the one state is another basis vector, uh, and then you can do any linear combination of the two. That's a superposition state. Uh, now, to visualize such a state, uh, quantum physicists like to use what's called a block sphere. And that's just a reparametrization of such a state. Here with two complex coefficients, we can reparametrize it in this way. Uh, ignoring a phase fact, you can sort of, yeah, you can put a phase factor outside and you can write it on this form. And then you plot it uh, as on a sphere. So these two angles here, theta and phi, they're the angles with the, this is a unit sphere, and then that's the angle with the z-axis, and then the phi is the angle here in the xy plane. And then some arbitrary state here, psi, will be a point on this unit sphere. And then the zero state is up here on the north pole, and the one state is down here on the south pole. Uh, so those are the only two states that a classical bit could be in, but the quantum bit can be in any point on this sphere. And the thing is now when we measure the state of this qubit at the end, we will not be given a result like, oh, it was uh, zero plus one, that was the state. When we measure, we will only get either the result zero or the result one. And the result we get is not deterministic, it will be probabilistic. It's determined by these coefficients alpha and beta. So actually the alpha uh, squared and beta squared, they are the probabilities or measuring zero or, an, or one when we do a measurement at the end of the circuit. And this explains why they need to sum to one. Because we need, we need to have total probability of measuring one result has to be one. Okay, so that was one qubit. Now we can have many qubits, many little block spheres here. Uh, and with n qubits, they can be in a supposition of two to the power n different states. All, all these different basis states, all in zero, all in one, everything in between. Uh, well, n classical bits, they will only be in one certain of these states at a time. So this means that storing all the information about the quantum state can require a lot of classical bits. Basically, a, a general quantum state of n qubits you need to specify all the 2 to the power n complex coefficients in this uh, supposition state, and you need to store that. And that's uh, so an exponential amount of information. In it. And gives a hint of that maybe quantum computers can do something that uh, is very difficult for classical computers, or would require a lot of resources for classical computers. Okay, so we have these states, and we want to now do operations on them. Uh, we need to do some logic. So let's see, what can we do with a single qubit? Well, first of all, uh, so we will have some operation, and I have some uh, arbitrary state here, psi, 
I write applying an operation on it as a u multiplied with this state. Uh, and then, so I do some operation that acts on it, it will change into some state psi prime. That means it will be some new superposition with new coefficients alpha prime, beta prime. Since uh, alpha squared plus beta squared had to be one to be to for probabilities to be correct, this needs to be also true for the new state we have, right? So the new state has to also have probability summing to one. So that means that the operation on I, I apply has to uh, preserve the norm of this state. So what is this? Well, this uh, state, it was just a, a two-component vector, right? So the matrices, uh, operations here, the gates, they are matrices. And they need to be unitary. That means they preserve the norm here. Uh, so this, this U is some 2 by 2 unitary matrix. Uh, some examples that you will see a lot are these X, Y and Z matrices, called the Pauli matrices. Uh, for example, this X matrix is the quantum version of a NOT gate. So you can see this with, again, this is just linear algebra. We have our vector here, alpha, beta, representing its superposition states, alpha zero plus beta one. We act with this X matrix on it, we multiply it, and we get beta alpha. So we flip or we uh, swap the coefficients for zero and one. So we flipped zero to one and one to zero. Uh, and all these operations you can visualize on this block sphere, basically. So this X gate is basically uh, taking the state and rotating it 180 degrees around the X axis. And then uh, the Y operation is rotating 180 degrees around the Y axis and so on. And you can have other operations than these particular ones. You can more generally do different rotations around different axes on the block sphere. And that's a single qubit gate. Um, when you look at circuits, you might see a few other gates than this X, Y, Z. Uh, you will see this H. You saw that on the first slide I had. Uh, that's called the Hadamard gate. It's a combination of this X and Z gates. Uh, it will basically take a qubit from the X basis to the Z basis or vice versa. So like, um, there's a T gate that gives you a certain phase on the one state. There's the S gate that gives you another phase uh, or a phase factor I on the one state and leaves the zero state unchanged. And you can see these T or phase gates as rotations around the Z axis with different angles. Okay, so you will see gates like this when you look at uh, your quantum programs. Then you will also have some two qubit gates. So just doing one qubit gate will not get you far. You need to do some cu two qubit gates to do some real uh, logic and uh, uh, have the qubits interact. Perhaps the gate you will see most is uh, called controlled knot. Um, so this uh, is written with this symbol. This symbol says, so the, the dot here shows that this upper qubit is controlling whether or not an operation is applied to the lower qubit. So control here means that if the upper qubit is in state one, then apply this operation on the lower qubit. If the upper qubit is in state zero, nothing happens. Uh, the operation to be applied here is the not gate, so the X operation. Uh, and one can now, uh, now we have two qubits. So the state space here will not be a two component vector, it will be a vector with four components and you will have a four by four matrix now representing the two qubit gate. Uh, so we see here if the, f and I, I marked here the rows and columns with the qubit states. So the left qubit here is the, the upper qubit here. So if the left, uh, the upper qubit is in zero, so c if you have zero, zero or zero, one states, then this uh, matrix is diagonal. It, you start in 0, 0, you end in 0, 0. You start in 0, 1, you end in 0, 1. Nothing happens. But if you then have the upper qubit in the state 1, then we see here 1, 0, and 1, 1. 
then these states uh, are swapped. So uh, you flip the state of the second qubit. You start if you start with one zero, you end up in one one. You start in one one, you end up in one zero. And you can do other two qubit gates like this that are controlled operations. Uh, you can do a controlled Z gate instead, so apply the Z and not the X, uh, conditioned on the state of the first qubit. So that will give um, a minus sign for the 1-1 one, one state and nothing happens to the other states, basically. Um, and here you see this. This is written as two controlled operations. Actually, on, something only happens if you are in state 1-1, one, one, so Sort of, it's both qubits in a way controlling whether something happens. That's why you have two parts here controlling. More generally, you can do a controlled unitary operation, uh, re write it like this: like first qubit controlling that something happens on the second qubit, and it will have this uh, structure of two by two matrices. Now, these control operations are not the only two qubit operations you can do. Uh, you also have uh, things like swap that you might see, which is just basically swapping the qubit state. So the state of qubit 1 will be swapped to into qubit 2, and the state of qubit 2 will be swapped to qubit 1. Uh, the matrix will look like this. Then we can go on. <laughs> we can do more complicated gates, if you want. We can do three qubit gates. We can do, for example, something called a Toffoli gate. So controlled, controlled, not gate. So we do an X gate on the third qubit if and only if the first and the second qubit are both in, uh, in state one. Or we can do something called a Fredkin gate, which is a controlled swap. We, if the first qubit is in state one, then we swap the states of qubits two and three. Now we see this is starting to get complicated. I won't go into uh, many qubit gates here. Uh, we, we might want to do more complicated operations on many qubits as part of some algorithm. Uh, but fortunately, we only need to do single and two qubit gates to achieve this. So all these multi qubit gates, three or more qubits involved, they can be decomposed into a sequence of single and two qubit gates. So was there a question? No, okay. Um, and this brings us to universal gate sets. So what gates do we need to be able to implement on our quantum computer in order to run any algorithm in principle? So if we first think about classical computing, uh, we say that a gate set is universal if it enables us to express any Boolean function on any number of bits. Uh, there are many examples of this. There's, for example, just a NAND gate on itself is actually a universal gate set. Um, if you have the only have AND gates and OR gates, it turns out you cannot do any computation. Uh, I think that's because you cannot flip uh, all the bits you want. Um, in the case of quantum computing, we say that the gate set is universal if we have, uh, if the gates therein can approximate any unitary transformation, so any transformation that preserves the probability, so any physical transformation, uh, on any number of qubits to any precision that we want, basically. Can I interrupt you, Anton? Yes. Am I heard, Apostolos? So there are some good questions coming in in HackMD, which I thought I could bring up. There was one that came in earlier. Maybe this serves to resolve some confusion that arose. So yep. regarding the blocks where mm -hmm. the qubits live in the XY plane, right? No. The qubits live on the surface of the sphere. Yes. So this is the unit sphere. So if you are on the on the on the sphere, then the um, uh, length of the vector from the origin is one. And that corresponds to the length this uh, norm being one that you have probability of one. Yeah, that's good. And so what we see in the sphere is the stereographic projection. That's not correct then. Uh, I'm not sure what the stereographic that, that projection is. No. 
but probably I think you addressed uh, that confusion. Yeah. So I mean, th this this uh, so I, light shaded blue here is sort of representing the xy plane, mm. and then you have some point here on the sphere. This red dot is a state that's on the sphere, and you can look at its projection on the xy plane to see what's this angle phi. Mm. Yes, and a rather long question. I'll read the whole thing. Um, I am curious about the Hamiltonian used in quantum computers. Will it be block diagonal? Also, we have different number of qubits which make up the 2 to the power of n basis states for the quantum state superposition. Will the correlation between different number of qubit states be important? Uh, let, let's take this step That's by step. Yeah, like, so what was one, the first so one? Someone is curious about the Hamiltonian used. Will it be, blo will it be block diagonal? Um, not necessarily. I not guess. necessarily. I mean, it's is it's block diagonal if it's if, if it's not if it doesn't entangle all the qubits at the same time. You, you, there's some uh, structure like block diagonal. Mm. To it. Mm. And one final final question then: Have the operators you mentioned already been implemented in the available quantum computers? Uh, uh, basically, yes. We will we will get uh, back to that. Okay. But, uh, uh, yeah, we will get. Uh, I think uh, all all of these I mentioned uh, have been in some way op implemented. Maybe not in a single step, but in a sequence of steps. So we were going to the universal gates. Yes. So let's look. What what are requirements on a universal gate set? for a quantum computer. Or rather, what, what are some ways in which uh, a quantum computer gate set could fail to be universal? Do you have any suggestions? Maybe I show one uh, example to, to show you what I, what I mean by failure. So uh, a gate set is not universal if it's not able to create superposition states. So if we have, for example, the x, uh, we say we always start in zero. And we have just the x gate. Well, we can flip zero to one and then one back to zero, but we cannot get any superposition state like zero plus one over square root of two. Or same, this c naught then is a conditional flip of a qubit. It will not create a superposition state either. So are there any other ways we can fail to uh, sort of create any quantum state that we want. Uh, set gates will also not uh, d do much, yes. Uh, you could perhaps say uh, there's no ability to create entanglement or doing uh, having the state of one qubit depend on the other, so doing some sort of conditional or other two qubit gate. Uh, so if we just have single qubit gates, we will not have a universal gate set, basically. Or it could be we can do uh, entanglement. We can uh, condition state of one qubit on another with C0, and we can do this Hadamard gate that takes you uh, like from 0 to 0 plus 1, for example. Uh, so we can do these superposition states, but still we don't get these, uh, say, rotations uh, around Z to get some... Uh, complex amplitudes in our superposition. So this seems to be sort of exhaustive. Okay, uh, let's say we can address all these things, then we should have a universal gate set, right? Uh, no. There are actually uh, gate sets. Uh, you take the Hadamard gate, the C0 gate, and the S gate. The S gate would give you uh, its, uh, complex amplitude. It's still not enough. Yes. Uh, sort of this S gate is a uh, pi over 2 rotation. So basically, if you start in zero and only have these gates, um, you start up in zero. Basically, you can go to any of these six cardinal points on the block set, like from zero to the ends of the z axis, the ends of the x axis, or the ends of the y axis. And you can move between these points and, and have some time, but that's uh, all you can do. And, and there is this theorem showing that if that's all you can do, then you can uh, simulate this efficiently on a classical computer, in a, if you have a bit clever with how you represent your state. 
because it's so limited. Okay, but if we now replace, uh, for example, anything else than this Hadamard gate in this gate set to do some, some other rotation, that's not just pi over 2 or pi, but some other angle, um, or actually almost any two qubit gate on its own that's not just C0 but has some more arbitrary rotation, you know, like not just rotate by pi condition, um, you, you have a universal gate set. In practice, what you will see in, in the quantum computers that we, that we have uh, and that uh, you will get to work with, you can do, there are a few like, say, pi and pi over 2 rotation around x and y, and then, say, maybe an arbitrary rotation around z. So you have some arbitrary uh, uh, rotation you can do around one axis for a single qubit. And then, uh, once you have sort of that rich control over a single qubit, then it's enough that you have one uh, entangling two qubit gate, like the C knot. That's what IBM uses in their hardware, for example. Um, and then you have a universal gate set. Okay, here's another question for you. Are there any problems that a classical computer can't solve, but a quantum computer can? Uh, yes. So, okay, my, maybe the you know I can be a bit more specific with the question, but uh, basically the answer is no. So in principle, we have if we have a classical computer that's big enough. You can store all the, these uh, amplitudes in the superposition state that you have on a quantum computer. You can store that on a classical computer, and you can sort of do these matrix multiplications. That it will be very big matrices, but still, uh, and that represent the quantum operations done on the quantum computer. So you can simulate the quantum computer on the classical computer. So, like any problem that can be solved by a quantum computer, you can run the same computation on a classical computer. It's just that it might take a lot more time, it might take a lot more memory. Well, it actually, you can get away with not too much memory if you have a lot, a lot of time. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it will not be efficient. Yeah. And so in practice, so, yeah, so, so the question for everyone is that, uh, yeah, how many qubits can you simulate? Like, is it actually possible with 60 or 100? Uh, I would say in practice with the supercomputers we have today, if you want to do a completely general quantum uh, operation on, on like 60 qubits or so, no, uh, there's not enough uh, computational resources to do that classically. But th this is more, uh, uh, more abstract. So yes, in practice, there, there are things that are Classic quantum computer can do that the classical computer can't do in in reasonable time. In in principle, there is not there's no uh, problem that's sort of unsolvable on a classical computer that could be solved by quantum. Yes. Yeah, I think here's a confusion between a computer and an algorithm because a computer is just a physical realization of a information processing system. Well, an algorithm is the actual procedure how to solve a particular computational problem. So it's not that that a classical computer cannot solve the same comp problems as in a qu quantum computer, but it's the actual classical algorithm that cannot represent the problem well enough. Well, you can, yeah, exactly. There are limitations to the representation that you can have in a classical algorithm that means that you will require a lot of computational resources to run it, but you will be able to run it with enough resources. Yeah, one of the articles that Google presented that, uh, was, uh, that they showed qu quantum su supremacy using their quantum algorithm, mm. but then just a few months later, a classical computer algorithm showed that it surpassed it just using classical uh, algorithmic principles. So it's not that, it's about the actual computer that solved it, it's the actual algorithm. Well, I mean, a, a quantum algorithm has, uh, I mean, can work with these supposition states. It has more tools to work with, so, uh, and can hopefully then take shortcuts sort of, to arrive at uh, a solution faster than a classical computer. 
uh, algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's about represent representing the problem and not actual the implement not necessarily the comp the architecture implementation. Yeah. I mean, what is like okay. Uh, a classical algorithm ha works with bits. A quantum algorithm works with qubits. A classical computer works with bits. A quantum computer works with qubits. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I see the exact distinction. Here, yes. Here's here's the answer that I wanted to give. Yes. Then so, given enough resources, you can store all the complex amplitude specifying the state of the quantum computer. Simulate all the gates in a quantum circuit. Um, now th that's sort of the thing in in in, uh, in theory then. But then, now say we have our quantum computer, we have a universal gate set, uh, but we might be worried about yeah. Now we have a certain algorithm we want to implement. Can we actually implement it sort of well enough with this universal gate set? Like or like we know in principle we can implement it, but maybe we need to apply all this gate, this limited set of gates uh, a lot of times. Uh, to to run it, um, and fortunately there is a theorem that tells us that uh, we're going to be okay, and this is the Solovey-Kitayev theorem. What this says is the following. Uh, well, I put up the text there. It's a mathematical formulation. I will break it down into uh, the words we understand from the lecture here. So it says that G let G be a finite subset of SU2. Uh, U is in SU2. So okay, what this actually says is SU2 is the space of all possible single qubit operations we can imagine, all unitary transformations. Uh, we have some specific unitary transformation that we want to implement on a single qubit. That's U. Now, G is a finite subset of all the possible operations. So, G is our gate set, our universal uh, our gate set. So, uh, so, a few operations that are uh, can act on a single qubit. Now, if the group generated by G is dense in SU2, this means if our gate set can generate all uh, possible operations, that is, if it's a universal gate set. Then for any epsilon greater than zero, it's possible to approximate u to precession epsilon. So if we have some small, uh, yeah, we want to get down to some precision. We want to get s a certain amount close to the, the actual operation we want to implement. Uh, we want to approximate this u the operation we want to implement. Uh, then it takes on the order of uh, logarithm to the four of 1 over epsilon gates from our universal gate set. So it means basically if we now increase the precision, we, we want to get really, really close to that operation we want to implement. We only need sort of a logarithmic number of gates more to, to reach that precision from our universal gate set. So this, this means really logarithmic number of gates is a small number, like it grows very slowly. Right? Uh, if we now have a n qubit, so a, a multi-qubit operation, then, well, we might need a lot of operation, it's exponential in the number of qubits and the possible operation we might need. But the precision just still scales, uh, or the number of gates still scales just logarithmically with precision. So it means that no, we have a certain uh, operation we think of, uh, some algorithm we want to implement, and we think we need to op implement it with a certain precision, we're going to be fine. Like As long as we have a universal gate set, we're going to be fine in practice. A question. Yes. I'm more worried about the exponential scaling with the number of qubits. Yes. Uh, how do we address that? Uh, well, if we could address that, then uh, we would break some uh, uh, something in the nature, I think. Uh, so it's basically saying that y you cannot do any any operation you can possibly imagine in in a short time. 
yeah, I think if if you could uh, get this down to some polynomial thing, I think you, uh, yeah, you would break this, uh, collapse the polynomial hierarchy or something. You would you would be able to solve NP-hard problems instantly or something like that. And it, that's just not physical or possible. But have you done something more uh, than hiding the exponential scaling into the number of gates if you compare to classical simulation? Yes, there there are still uh, there there are still many operations you can do that so doesn't scale exponentially, but still uh, really uses superposition and entanglement uh, and, and so on in, in a way that a classical computer couldn't efficiently simulate. Maybe it's a stupid question, but when you talk about G being dense in SU two, yes, you talk about dense in the topological sense, like the closure being equal to. Yeah, it it means that. In, the, in uh, that case, do you have any topology on in that group? Or? Mm, no, I I I think it just means that uh, from G you can generate any operation in okay. SU two. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, we're almost at the end. So now, this is how a an algorithm could look. We have three qubits here. We want to do a number of gates on them. Um, and we see here oh, we want to do some Z gate and some square root of X. This is just half of an X rotation. Um, we want to do some C Z gates between different qubits and so on. Now, so we have these sequences of gates acting on quantum states. Now, if we want to now run it on a specific hardware, we need to compile it, probably. So, we need to first check, okay, do I have all these gates in this circuit, in the uh, native gate set? So, this universal gate set that I have uh, available, the physical operations I have available on my quantum computer. Uh, if I don't, maybe I, then I need to decompose it, like convert it into a sequence from my universal gate set. Uh, and then you need to say, sort of, okay, here there's going to be some gate between qubit 1 and 2. Here there's going to be some gate between 0 and 2. Like, maybe I only have uh, nearest neighbor interactions on my hardware. Then I need to be a bit careful, yeah, how do I uh, assign, like, a qubit in this algorithm to a qubit, actually, that I have on my hardware, so that actually they are next to each other when they need to be. Uh, when I run my computation on my hardware. Uh, if I can't do that, I might need to do some swap gates do, uh, to bring qubit states close to each other on the hardware uh, during this uh, algorithm. Uh, and then when I've done all this, then I have something that can run actually on my hardware. Uh, and then I need to finally check now with all these new gates I inserted, maybe there are things that sort of I can compress this circuit in different, maybe two or three of these gates in the sequence actually correspond to one gate that I also have available in my gate set. So, so uh, these are things that uh, sort of take place when you send some job to a quantum computer. I think you will see this in the exercises you do. Uh, uh, what's actually implemented is uh, maybe not exactly what you told it to. Like, it, it's equivalent, but it's going to be maybe a different sequence of gates that does the same thing. And you will be able to see this in uh, uh, in Qiskit also, like uh, called the transpiled circuit. So on that topic, there's a question in HackMD. Uh, can I define an arbitrary operator on available quantum computing machines, or only the ones that are fabric-delivered? Mm. I think in principle you can uh, define an arbitrary operator. Um. So I think we should uh, direct this question to Jake Muff, maybe, yeah. who is not here right now, but he will join us later. He's uh, operating the Helmi machine in uh, okay. Finland. And can I, while uh, yep. I have your attention, so going back to G, uh, if it's only nearly dense, is there some complexity bound, just to clarify that point? I don't know. 
Okay. Uh, if it's only nearly dense, no, uh, I, I don't know what one can say then. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I've reached the summary of the talk. So uh, the, these are the main takeaways, uh, I think. So we have these quantum bits, so quantum version of classical bits, and the quantumness is manifest in that they can be in superposition states. And we saw this represented with the, the block sphere. So we can not just be on the north and south pole, but we can be anywhere on the surface of the Earth here. Uh, if we have a general multi-qubit state with a superposition, um, we may need exponentially many classical bits to describe uh, this state, because we need to keep track of all the complex amplitudes in that superposition. Now, when we have our quantum states, uh, we can run uh, logic on them, uh, algorithms, by applying a sequence of single and two qubit gates. And these are unitary matrices that act on the qubit states, which are represented as vectors. And it's enough to have, if we have the right set of single and two qubit gates that's universal, we can implement any operation in principle. Uh, and we may need to compile our quantum algorithm to fit on the quantum hardware, like to have the right native gates, uh, to have the right interactions and so on. Uh, but we have fortunately the solovic tire theorem that tells us that if we have the universal gate set, at least uh, the precision uh, will not give a prohibitive overhead in the length of the circuit. That's the basics of quantum computing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So regarding the precision, there's a question here in HackMD. Can you give comparative examples regarding the precision? Comparative examples? Um, I don't have an example at hand. Mm. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, the first question is when you say the multi-gate qubits can be decomposed to uh, two uh, uh, qubits, uh, do you mean that, do, uh, is that under the assumption that we have infinite coherent time? Yes, I did not talk about coherence time at all here. All I was, yes. So all the things I showed here was sort of assuming we have perfect qubits. Okay. Uh, of course, you know, in practice, we don't want too long circuits because we, our states don't live forever. We don't have perfect quantum error correction yet, uh, so coherence time will limit us. And that's why we want to have circuits short. But yes, I did not consider all, all I things I showed were sort of on ideal qubits. So uh, the last point you mentioned that any high-level quantum algorithm can be compiled to fit the real physical hardware. Mm. So in order to do that, do you mean that it is really can ignore how the physical components are related and uh, how they can entangle each other with the assumption that they have infinite or limited coherent time? So again, yeah, if, if you have limited coherence time, I mean, th there will be practical limits on how long circuits you can run. Uh, and also connectivity, as I mentioned, you may need to insert these swap gates if, if you need to do an operation between cu two qubits and these are not physically sort of connected on your device. You will need to swap their states to other qubits that are next to each other. Uh, it depends on your platform. But uh, like for with trapped ions, they can do basically uh, entangle any two qubits in their chain of ions. But for superconducting qubits, you will need to swap them here. Of course, that will make your circuit longer because you need to do this e these swaps. If coherence time is an issue, which it is, uh, th this will be, of course, uh, bad for your algorithm. So may I say that in the near future, if we really want any practical applications can be used no matter in academic or in commerce, uh, in commercial, uh, we cannot just 
do what we are doing for the classical programming that we ignore the hardware architecture. We have to be very specific. Okay, my algorithm or my application will be binding to which is hardware, and uh, under his uh, hardware limitation, I can still gain the pro uh, uh, speed up. Yes. Exactly. You, we are still at the very early stage in sort of like vacuum tubes or punch cards. Like you really, I mean, I'm showing these circuits, these algorithms. I'm not showing so. I'm not saying oh we have a for loop and, and we do this. I'm really showing oh we take this single qubit, we do this operation on it, and then we do that operation. We, we are really at this this level when we are talking about the circuits. Also in then. Yes, we need to really do optimize as much as we can the compilation to, to actually have it run in a reasonable time. Um, so yeah, that's that's the level at where we're at. Thank you. So uh, uh, I mean, in in Kiskit, I think you will uh, that you will be using the, there are uh, uh, sort of inbuilt compilers. And you, you you can you can use them there. Uh, I don't have anything prepared to show you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, and this is m very much ongoing research. We also, ha I also have projects on this. Like compilers are not optimized yet. So, uh, um, it's something that many big companies are working on. Like, there's a quite large overhead when you try to compile a bit larger circuits onto hardware. Like they become much longer than they origin originally were, and there's definitely room for improvement there. Thank you for a very nice introduction. Um, I want to come back to the decoherence phenomena, but more fundamental question. So you showed us all these sort of perfect quantum circuit elements. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to use them to c model the decoherence phenomena, or do you need to add something beyond that to sort of describe what your effective circuits, and if we take the transmon platform in particular? I think, uh, in principle, uh, there are quantum simulation algorithms for, like, you want to uh, model some quantum system coupled to a bath, like an environment that introduces decoherence. You can model this uh, environment with uh, a number of qubits. Uh, yes. You might need a lot of them, but... Yeah. <laughs> So going back here to a fundamental question, why can we actually make universal quantum gates with two qubit gates and one qubit gates? This is from HackMD. Um, basically because, uh, say, uh, let's uh, look at these three qubit gates. So these three qubit gates, they will sort of uh, entangle three qubits. Um, uh, like make the state of this one qubit depend on the states of the others, but you can sort of decompose that into operations where you okay you make the state depend on th this qubit and then you make the state depend on the other qubit also and yeah you can you can make it uh, like uh, you can gradually distribute entanglement by doing it in steps of two qubit gates. <coughs> So it's time for exercises today on classical hardware, yeah? And this can be either your laptops or on the notebook uh, service. If you run into problems, technical problems, something's not working, you cannot log into notebook CEC or you cannot install packages on your own machine, then raise the issue here in the room. You can um, let us know or you can write it in HackMD. And <clears throat> I want to tell you about a signaling system that we'll use because it can be boring to keep your hand up in the air for a very long time if there are many questions. So pick one of these red sticky notes if you have a problem and put it on your laptop like this if you have a problem. And then we know. So I want to introduce Stefan Hill. He will be our guide. So we will be walking through Jupyter Notebooks they, these are now linked. Um, you can see them in the lesson material. And he will walk you through them. And then you can you get exercises to do in your own Jupyter Notebook environment, whether it's on your laptop or in the cloud, CEC cloud. 
And you can copy paste code blocks from the notebook and the training material, or you can open, if you log in to CEC notebooks, you, I think you will have those notebooks there. Um, any other housekeeping I was thinking of? Questions in HackMD. We will answer also questions from our remote participants over Zoom. I mean, use HackMD as usual. And with that, I hand over the word. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tor, for the introduction. I'm Stefan. I'm working at Chalmers uh, in the MC2 department. And uh, we are building a quantum software stack. Tomorrow there will be also a lecture about that. And with me there is also Niklas. Um, he's working in the same team and he will run around and help you with individual problems. Um, it's the first time that I'm giving a workshop, so don't be mean. Um, we have two ways to access uh, the notebooks. One would be on the page of the uh, workshop uh, and you could copy paste it to your own uh, environment, local interpreter, uh, or you log in to uh, notebooks.csa.fi then you see a Jupyter notebook like this. Before we start you're probably all using um, Python on a, let's say, daily or a weekly basis. Or maybe you can just raise hands if you're using Python less than twice in a month. Okay. So the majority of uh, people know how to uh, read and write uh, Python programs. Great. The notebooks are structured like follows. In the first uh, notebook, we will go a bit uh, through single qubit gates. And in the second notebook, we will take a look what's happening when we take multiple qubits and uh, when we entangle them. And in the last notebook, we will have a little application, which is quantum teleportation. With that, let's take a look at the first notebook. In the morning lecture, Anton already introduced the circuit model. There's uh, also some other models, for example, uh, ZX calculus or um, yeah, a more mathematical way to approach uh, quantum computing and uh, how a computation is done. But using circuits is the most um, used in industry and there's uh, it's like the most uh, easy to um, uh, access for most of the people. For example, you can run your own uh, algorithms in the Qiskit uh, IBM cloud or tomorrow also on Helmi. So let's take a look at this circuit. I can zoom in a bit more. So on the left side, you can see uh, the circuit is initialized with this state of zeros. That's the default when you're using um, Qiskit library. And then you can add your gates. We will look at this uh, in the code soon. And then you have a measurement. The state in the beginning here is uh, phi, uh, phi i and then we have uh, phi f for uh, this state over here before we measure. So let's take a look how a very simple circuit looks like in Qiskit. This is the first uh, code cell. Um, you can either open it yourself or follow on the screen. So first what we have to do, we have to import all the libraries um, that we need from Qiskit. We need a basic circuit. We need air is uh, air is a simulator package, and for this uh, we don't need a plot function, but we will use it later. Then we define our quantum circuit, 
the number here, this first parameter denotes how many qubits we want to use. And then we can add our gates to the circuit. In that case, we add an X gate <coughs> to the to the qubit number zero. We're counting from zero to uh, up up how many qubits we are using. And then we add a measurement. So we measure on all qubits. In this case, just this one qubit. And in order to run it, we have to define where we want to run it. Maybe we want to run it on a simulator or on a real hardware. And in Qiskit, we have these so-called backends. So the backend is basically it's your quantum computer where you shoot the circuit. And this circuit you're going to run. And this run function will return you a result which you can access with a dot result. And the result uh, will be a measurement. And here you can see um, from which uh, measurement basis we were always measuring in this uh, uh, on the on the main axis of the of the block sphere. So we will always uh, get zeros and ones if we have uh, one qubit. And then the number of how often we measure a zero or a one as a dictionary. So we can also run this cell. It gives us uh, one all the time because we um, had the qubit in our zero state. We applied an X gate, so it returned, uh, it, it switched to the excited state. And so we measure always one in this simple example. Are there questions so far? Okay, so let's continue. We can also plot it as a histogram. It's becoming a bit more, um, more uh, <laughs> apparent why we need this uh, later. Right now, uh, this histogram just shows uh, shows that the one state uh, was measured a thousand twenty four times. We can also draw our circuit. Then it looks like this. We have uh, our qubit and then uh, our measurement. It's uh, on a classical readout line. Uh, and we have uh, an X gate. This uh, dashed line is not uh, affecting the circuit. It's just uh, to visualize. Maybe you have a big algorithm and you want to, um, to have several sections of the algorithm. This is a bit more sophisticated, how to draw it. And we also show the initial state on the left side. Now we see that the qubit was in a ground state before we applied the gate. And here you can also change the way you plot it. And this is now the first exercise uh, for those that have uh, the notebook open uh, and also for the people following online. Uh, you can uh, try to change this output parameter to text and uh, see what what's happening. Yes, uh, Qiskit is uh, having several functionalities and uh, IBM is just giving them uh, some names. And AIR is like the package which uh, is implementing a simulator on a classical hardware uh, to run the quantum circuits. So uh, AIR is just a factory in this case where we call it, and then we get a we get a backend which is the AIR simulator, and it's the standard simulator that IBM uses uh, when they're simulating uh, quantum circuits. Yes, when you wanted to run it on your own computer and simulate it. There are other um, other backends you can choose. I think uh, this will be explained more in detail tomorrow when uh, Helmi is introduced. Uh, but it looks pretty similar. You would say something like 
IBM Q provider or something like this mm, dot get backend and then you would say I want to have this specific quantum computer for example there are several uh, hosted in different locations on the world and you want to take the closest or the one that has like the qubits you need um, or with least jobs in the queue uh, or for example tomorrow for to access Helmi there's a similar procedure um, so the question was uh, what is the uh, line in the bottom here with the readout uh, this is a classical bit so when you're measuring with this 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 symbol means a measurement uh, you are measuring either a one or a zero and you want to store this in a classical re register so this is what uh, it you can have multiple registers to read out and this uh, just means like this is the first register like where you measure okay so for for the participants online it was maybe not to hear uh, but the readout it means like uh, we have one total qubit for classical classical bits to read out and this is the zeros uh, bit that we measure to. Can we maybe get one microphone for Niklas? Yes. <laughs> okay, so how many people are able to run the algorithm now? Okay, that's quite some more, and you're uh, spread everywhere in the room, so maybe you can also help your neighbor if uh, if you see any problem you can solve. <laughs> we will continue. I will show what's the output. If you put text, it just looks a bit um, bit more like on a console. If for example, let's say you don't have Matplotlib installed and you want to see how your circuit looks like. Okay, so we now have uh, seen a simple circuit. Are there any questions before I continue? The dash line, uh, it's just uh, to separate it visually. The dash line uh, doesn't uh, affect the circuit at all. Yeah, you can also, uh, if you have a very long algorithm, you can uh, put several dash lines in between to say like, this is my first step in the algorithm, that's my next step. We will see a slightly larger algorithm later, so we can uh, take a look. Okay, so regarding the measurement, uh, now in the first, in the first uh, circuit, we had the default initialization of the values. Uh, in this next circuit that we are going to construct, we will put the qubit state in the beginning and we set it with this function qc initialize. And we can initialize it with this state vector. That means our qubit is not starting in the cat0 state like in the uh, in the ground state but already in a super uh, in a superposition state that we define here and it's this state you can uh, write it down mathematically like this it's a similar state you would produce uh, by application of a hardmart we will see later how this uh, looks like um on this initialized state we can also apply our X gate and then we can measure and we can also see our result but it will look slightly different to before so because our qubit was now in a state where it was not in a ground or uh, uh, excited state it was in a superposition before uh, we will sometimes measure a zero and sometimes we will measure a one and uh, this probability distribution you will get uh, you can see in this plot here uh, 
Uh, no, because we are repeating the experiment a lot of times, but we can uh, put the number of shots uh, to a very high number. So uh, then you will see like the higher our number is getting, uh, the more equal these uh, this, uh, yeah, the outcomes will be. So it's like a random number generation and uh, when you generate a certain amount of shots, you get that uh, distribution of, uh, of states. Exactly. Okay. Uh, uh, first question is, uh, what will happen if we initialize the state, but uh, we do not normalize it, or the probability is not conserved to one? That's a good question. I never did that, but we can try it. So you get the Qiskit error. So they will, they will check? Yes. And And uh, when we do the simulation, are we able to reset or control the redundancy? So we can just, in order to have a deterministic result, no matter it's for the education purpose or just to control the experiment? Um, you probably, mm, you can probably do that. Uh, I think you might be able to set uh, something like a numpy random seed because probably Qiskit is also based on this. But we can uh, take the break and look into the documentation for this. Okay. Or you, you can write down it also in the hack MB MD and then it will be saved for the whole workshop. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Hopefully everybody who was uh, running the circuit before is now also able to execute this cell. Uh, and we have some exercises, so maybe we have some five minutes. You can sit around uh, the notebooks that are on the table uh, that are working. Uh, and you can change a bit on the number of shots and on the uh, first state, like the um, state you initialize it. Uh, and you can see uh, how this distribution will change. So here are some uh, suggestions on how you can change it, but of course you can uh, also put in your own numbers uh, and see what's happening. Okay, I think the majority of people uh, has got some uh, results and got it running. Uh, so let's have a little look. We uh, set our shots already here for 4,000, uh, but we can also play a bit with this. Um, so we set it uh, to... Oops, that was not the wrong square root 1 one third oops wait let's just copy paste this one mm. so then it looks should look like this uh, and as you see, I copied here this 1J times uh, square root. So it's already al also possible to uh, take complex numbers. Because the quantum state lives in a, um, uh, in a complex space. Are there any questions about that? Yes. Usually the default value is 1024. It's reasonably large. Uh, uh, One thousand and oh yeah, the question was: uh, Is there like a formula to calculate the number yeah, of shots? That every um, essentially, the shots it it work like this: uh, You have your quantum computing backend, then you submit the circuit, and then you measure, let's say, a thousand times. 
uh, if you want to have a super high accuracy and you have a state where you have to distinguish these um, these probabilities so if you take let's say five shots then uh, you would not see a good picture like it's I the law of uh, large numbers yeah question is that uh, just think that uh, i have a circuit with 1000 qubit uh, uh -huh. how many shots is necessary or i have a circuit with two qubits then how many shots is necessary yeah is there any formula um not that i know uh it's more like um i'm also not uh, having a phd on this topic thank you um <laughs> so uh you would uh you would uh, probably take like from your feelings experience like like you put the number of neurons in a neural network um yeah i know there is a formula but i uh, i have forgotten so i will say. yeah um maybe we can put it in uh, also in the manual and then uh, someone like uh, anton uh, probably has a good answer to this <laughs> thank you so much or is there a formula uh, i'm not <laughs> i'm not certain if there's a formula no D do you mean that for a given circuit of a number of qubits how many shots you need to reconstruct the state was that the question if the question was that for a given circuit of a certain size that you need a number of shots to reconstruct the state i'm not sure also given you can't always reconstruct the state just given one type of measurement which we might see in this exercise that we did that if you add this complex number then mm -hmm. the amplitude or the histogram is the same so you can't construct it that easily Um, the larger your circle is, um, I mean, uh, the problem with current hardware is the coherence time. So uh, if you have a very large uh, deep circle, circuit, uh, it it will have a very um, bad quality, your result. Um, yes. If you can find it, uh, please share it also in the document. Yeah, thanks. For a circuit of size n, the number of possible outcomes would be 2 to n, right? And then there would be a, like a statistical question. How much shots do you need to reconstruct that? But at least it grows exponentially the number of possible outcomes. Okay, let's uh, see how to visualize a qubit state. So this plot block vector function in the Qiskit package, it just takes a, a vector and uh, plots it, but it it's very useful uh, like when you want to extract uh, the state vector from your circuit that you're running currently. Um, we will take a look how this uh, how this block uh, sphere will look like uh, when we apply some gates. Uh, before, I just want to quickly show you these uh, three gates. It's the poly rotations, like uh, it's uh, the X, Y, and Z rotation, about 180 degrees. Um, and if you add these to the circuit, yeah, it looks like this when you draw it. Um, but we can now play a bit around how this will look when we uh, plot it. So what's our current setup? We have still our quantum circuit with one qubit. We initialize it in this uh, state uh, 1 divided by square root 2, 1 divided by square root 2. Apply an X gate, run it in the simulator. We save the state vector from our circuit. We have to do it before we run, by the way. Um, and also for the final state, we can um, get the state vector with this function, get state vector. It's also d documented in the Qiskit library. And then the outcome looks like this. So we have our um, quantum state on the x-axis. 
This is due to uh, how we initialize the circuit. We can maybe play a bit around um, that, for example, we do not initialize the quantum circuit uh, with this state, but we just apply an X gate. So now you can see it, it looks a bit different because uh, before it was in initialized now with the default value uh, 0. The X gate rotates it to the 1. Uh, we can also remove uh, our X gate. Then we see, okay, this is how the circuit looks. We just initialize it. Uh, so essentially this is a very good tool if you want to see how what, what your gate when you have a lot of gate uh, uh, for the qubit, um, how this affects your rotation. Um, it's very good uh, for learning. And um, let's use this initial state from before and as a little exercise plot what's happening with a set gate. You can also try what's happening with the y gate. One minute, um, uh, and everybody for uh, try to run it on your own computer. Uh, the question is: uh, Is there a way to uh, display uh, multiple versions of uh, the state vector? For example, if I apply three gates x, y, and z, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to. Uh, display the effects on a state vector when I apply x, then y, and then z. Because I see that we plot block multi-vector the final state. Mm -hmm. Can we plot any other state, intermediate Can state? Yes, we could also plot uh, a state vector in between. Uh, there's also libraries that uh, can make you plot like a GIF, how the vector developed over time. Uh, I'm unsure how, how what was the name for this library at the moment, but uh, you can also sim like animate animate this uh, block sphere. Pro probably it's also maybe it's already in Kiskit when you search for animate underscore block sphere. Uh, any other questions? Did everybody who run it with a uh, set gate? come to this outcome. Yes. Right, so both both the Y gate and, and the Z gate did the same thing actually, right? Um, the Y gate should move it, yes. So r regarding the previous question about the trajectory, uh, it doesn't actually really matter anyhow, does it? Whether you take an X gate, a Y gate or a Z gate? Uh, the trajectory, how I get from initial to final state? No, does, yeah. no. Like uh, there's a lot of ways how you can uh, rotate it on the block sphere. Yeah. It doesn't give me any any kind of physical information at all. Um, do you mean physical information? It's only the initial state and the final state that actually matter. I shouldn't care about how I got there. Yeah, it it depends sometimes on uh, how you design the algorithm. Sometimes you have uh, only a certain uh, number of or a certain gates implemented on your um, hardware. So, um, yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Um, with the Hadamard gate, uh, it's one of the more interesting gates uh, that uh, creates a superposition. So if we are in a ground state and apply a Hadamard gate, we will end up in the superposition state that we used before uh, to, initialize, to initialize our circuits. And Hadamard um, gate is just this uh, H uh, block. And uh, same setup, we have this circuit from before. We uh, apply a Hadamard gate and we plot it, so it looks like this. It's uh, looking exactly like we uh, initialized our circuit before with this uh, state vector. Um, and now we can 
also add some more gates. That's the next exercise. So try to play around a bit uh, how this affects uh, the circuit when you put in a harder mode gate and uh, several rotation gates, for example, a set gate. We can go around and uh, answer questions. Okay, I see people are already discussing. I don't want to interrupt, uh, but uh, just uh, a question that I got. Um, like, um, we can um, also have rotations around like various angles. So there's also gates in a Qiskit that uh, implement a general rotation. So we can add the angle for X, Y, Z where we want to have it. And then we rotate it to exactly that uh, angle. Uh, we'll not to go into detail, but the x like the uh, x or the z that we are using here is always a rotation around uh, pi and if you want to have a full rotation it's about uh, 2 pi and if we have pi half then it will uh, end up uh, uh, just like a quarter rotation and actually that's also now part of the next thing that we are looking into uh, this is the rotational gate, so we can have a rotation around the x-axis uh, with uh, pi over 2. And uh, you can think of it as um, the qubit is uh, in its ground state over here. That's the x-axis. And now we're turning this x-axis for pi uh, half. So the arrow will walk from the top to here to the equator. Uh, and that's how the rx gate looks like. And if we just put an, an x gate instead, it will just travel um, to the very bottom. Like this. So it will uh, go this pi half, but an additional pi half, and then we end up in the bottom. And also, I got this question how we can like uh, transpose, or like we can build together the Hadamard gate. Of course, we can also build up the Hadamard gate with uh, these kind of rotations. So if we put our um, our uh, circuit uh, pi half on this side and then we have to rotate it around the z-axis so also a pi half so we would say r z and p pi over 2 where we end up is also here so that's the same like application of a harder mode gate um, that was somewhere over here in this sentence. Alternatively, it can be viewed as rotation around the axis in direction of the block vector. So that's the harder mode gate. Uh, and there are several ways we can achieve this uh, harder mode uh, position. Okay. Um, maybe take this uh, code section also before you can again like uh, play around with a bit with the code. Um, there's also the P gate. Uh, the P gate um, adds a phase, um, and uh, it's essentially the gate that uh, Anton presented in the morning in the lecture. So it's a quarter rotation um, around the face uh, axis, so the z-axis. Here, uh, yeah, a quarter rotation around the z-axis. The reason why we have this uh, p-gate or this h-gate is just because these are steps that are repeated very often, so we just have an uh, abbreviation of this. Okay, so um, 
there's a last exercise for this uh, code cell. Uh, change the above code so that the final state is along the x-axis. And there is a lot of uh, ways to achieve this. You can uh, either rotate it like maybe uh, three times more around the face. Um, or you uh, can uh, apply another Hardamart gate. Uh, just uh, try and play, but it's it's like Lego. You have these gates, and you can um, build some stuff. Let's say two more minutes, and then we have a coffee break. Question here: uh, P and R Z is the same. Uh, P is uh, a rotation about uh, uh, pi pi quarter uh, pi half, which is a quarter rotation, uh, and R Z. Uh, you can define the angle by putting uh, in how ma how many pi's you want to rotate it. Are there any more questions? We got a question: um, How do I know which direction we rotate it? Um, I took like physics last time in high school, so I can uh, maybe show you like the the rules that we learn. So, in order to determine what's x, y, and z axis direction, you take the right hand, uh, make a move like this. I hope people online can see it as well. So you have your thumbs. That's your x. You have uh, your this. How's this finger in English? Uh, the pointing. <laughs> Index finger. Um, this is uh, pointing towards the Y, and then the, uh, yeah, the, the, this finger is pointing upwards. It's the Z. And then when we rotate, we always take our thumb, and then uh, the rotation direction is where the other fingers are pointing. <laughs> Relevant question here from HackMD. So the general single qubit gate has two parameters, elevation and azimuth. Is there a fast way to change these depending on the result of the most recent computation? Okay, so like uh, you run the circuit and uh, read the values from the last shot, if I get the question correctly. Uh, you can do it like after the next shot, but you can't do it during the computation. Um, I think that's actually also like an open um, qu question of research. Uh, it's called dynamic uh, quantum programming, uh, whether you can change uh, states during uh, uh, during its uh, executed your circuit. And maybe, uh, I'm unsure, maybe there are some other ways like in the ZX calculus that find a way around it. Okay, no. <laughs> Okay, then I would say we have a little coffee break and after the coffee break we continue working with multiple qubits and how they interact with each other. Uh, so welcome back to the second tutorial. Uh, in this tutorial we will now uh, take a look at uh, how we are uh, using several qubits. Like we will start with, first we will start just uh, having the qubit uh, separately and then we will also first uh, entanglement uh, experiments we will start uh, to entangle the qubits um, to see what's really the advantage uh, of uh, using a quantum computer okay uh, when we have a qubit uh, like a circuit with uh, two qubits we uh, would not uh, initialize it in a zero state or in a one state, but uh, rather in one of these four uh, states. Uh, and the representation uh, would be uh, like with a matrix uh, alpha uh, on these four basis states. So let's take a look at a little larger circuit. This is uh, how we make it larger. We put uh, three here, like it's um, it's uh, the uh, number of qubits we are using. 
And then we can apply an X gate to the first qubit, to the second qubit, and to the third qubit, and also make a measurement on all qubits. Uh, and it's the same procedure. We take our simulation backend, run it, and then we can get our dictionary with the counts. Let's see. And the state is 111 because we initialized our circuit in a 0, 0, 0 states and for each qubit we rotated it to 1. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention Anastasia put into the HackMD a uh, link um, so you can play later. Um, it's a web page where you can uh, have a block sphere and then uh, just rotate uh, and click on the side there's different different gates uh, and then you see immediately how the uh, vector changes on the block sphere. That's maybe a bit uh, more interactive and a bit easier to grasp uh, than running it uh, as code in the Jupyter Notebook. So if we draw our multi-qubit circuit you can see it looks like this um, now we have uh, three qubits and they are all measured on a, a different uh, readout line. So um, the first qubit is measured on the first classical bit. The second is also on the second classical bit and the third is on the third classical bit. Similar to the first exercise we can also plot the histogram. Since now we are having uh, three qubits in our circuit, we get a total of two to the power of three possible outcome states, which is um, eight if we have uh, a measurement for all of the circuits. We will gonna see how this looks like soon. Um, because when we apply a Hadamard gate, we will put uh, all the qubits in a superposition and now it won't be like a distribution uh, between the two states but rather an like equal probability for all of the eight states that we have for our qubit. We can see here it doesn't look so equally distributed but that's probably just because we have just a hundred shots so maybe if we take a 10,000 shots and plot it again it looks uh, way more uh, fair distributed okay uh, are there any questions so far uh, what is changing for multiple qubits Maybe what's interesting, a question that can come up to your mind, do I have to put uh, the gates always first on the first uh, or on the second? It doesn't matter at all. So if we uh, put um, the qubit over here uh, and run it again, it's uh, pretty similar. Also when you draw it, you see it is uh, doesn't affect the whole circuit. Okay. Uh, you can see here also the mathematical uh, description of the state in which the circuit is after applying all the Hadamard gates. So it's like um, this one over the square root of eight. So what you could also do to achieve the same outcome Maybe somebody uh, can tell me uh, uh, what you can also uh, do to produce this same outcome by knowing that there's a state vector like this. Okay, it's uh, you can also use this state vector to initialize your circuit and then uh, you would uh, come to the same outcome. Uh, this is the state vector, by the way, if you want to uh, print it. 
um, we are now going to see how we can visualize uh, these multi qubits on a Bloch sphere. So let's run it again. Oh, sorry, I skipped this step. Um, this is this is not the visualization uh, of the state, but it's rather the state vector itself. So you can see it's like the square root uh, one one over the square root of eight uh, for each component uh, when we measure this state vector during the code. Um, maybe a bit uh, slow, slower explanation again. So we have our circuit with uh, three qubits. We apply a Hadamard gate to all of the qubits. And this results in our state vector, which is uh, one over the square root of eight for each component of this uh, state vector. You can see here. It's becoming more apparent if we visualize it. So if we visualize it, you can see that all our qubits are now in the uh, in the position when you apply a Hadamard gate. So the, the arrows are pointing all in this uh, on this uh, on the x-axis direction. Okay, we will now play a bit around and I think we can make a longer session, uh, like around 10 minutes, um, where you can apply different gates on uh, all the different qubits and uh, try to produce uh, some uh, outcomes of uh, these spheres. So um, here's some suggestions, but you can maybe try to uh, produce uh, one arrow pointing on the x-axis, one arrow pointing into the other direction, and one uh, arrow pointing again to the x-axis, um, so that you just get a bit familiar with uh, how to how to uh, have these multi qubits. Um, uh, how, how to deal with the multi qubits, and it's always the index of the qubit that you want to address that you're putting here. And if you, for example, have a, a rotational gate um, like this, uh, and you want to uh, rotate it, you have to put the index of your qubit. Um, as the second argument. Oh shit, it was x rotation doesn't make a difference. Okay. So you see I applied this um, y rotation on the first qubit and now we apply it on the last qubit. Okay, so uh, start uh, with uh, this exercise, apply the H only to the second qubit, uh, and we will go around and uh, help you if there are questions. Yes, there's already a question. Okay. Okay, it looks like everybody uh, could uh, perform some rotations and uh, get some uh, new qubit states. Uh, we got one interesting question uh, during uh, I walked around. Um, and it's like, um, how do we how do we uh, rotate all these qubits? Like, um, is there like a timing required if we have multiple qubits? And yes, that is. And maybe there will be something in the lecture tomorrow about the software stack and about the calibration. So indeed, when you have uh, your qubits and you want to run a gate that is using two qubits, we will take a look into this now. You will have to time it so they are in the same state that you want to have them at the right time. So there's uh, 
that's uh, during the um, um, yeah during you run your algorithm you have to schedule the pulses it depends on the platform but for superconducting qubits it's uh, the pulses that you send to your Josephson junction um, I would say the state vector is the state of the whole system. I'm unsure whether you would just have one qubit um, angled, then you can get it. But not sure. Um, uh, you can look into the documentation for get state vector probably and save state vector maybe there's an argument you can pass to get one qubit i mean here you would take the uh, first two components of the vector and normalize it so they are they are one again like the length then you also have your state vector that would be like a workaround if you would program the function yourself but check the documentation for the get state vector yeah Yes. So the, the the circuit as a whole does not have to be reversible. Um, so if, if I take one one vector one qubit, then it won't be reversible, right? It's like throwing away information. Uh, the whole circuit, um, you can. Uh, um, uh, as soon as you measure you your circuit uh, you you yeah um but before you measure it doesn't really matter you can move it around as you wish when you're plotting the block spheres can you get only one of the qubits then As well for this, maybe you take a look into the documentation, because as soon as your state vector is just having two components, it will just plot one block sphere. The nice thing here is that your state vector has eight components, and Qiskit knows that this refers to three qubits and plots you three uh, block spheres. Okay, so let's start with multi-qubit gates. Uh, and that's the step where we get the entanglement, where we make our our uh, algorithms actually useful. And the most simple uh, entanglement, the most simple two-qubit gate that creates entanglement is the C0 gate. Joran already showed it and um, Anton as well. So let's say we have a quantum circuit with two qubits. We will write uh, the controlled x uh, on qubit 0 and qubit 1. So 0 is the control qubit. So if and uh, the 0 qubit would be in the if clause, it would be the first uh, argument. Uh, and then the target qubit would uh, rotate around the x axis. Then we measure. And we get uh, zero and zero. So the control qubit was zero. So we don't rotate the um, the target qubit. Let's see what happens if our control qubit is one, uh, like this. And we get actually like one for the control qubit and the second qubit also gonna be um, one because it was flipped exactly um, 180 um, degrees and if we for example uh, apply an x gate on our second qubit as well so now the second qubit is also uh, flipped before, then it would be um, zero uh, one state, so it's flipped back. Uh, the the controlled. We're reading this one from the back, but uh, so now the um, the first uh, qubit it would be flipped back, like 
uh, because the first qubit was in the one state and the second qubit was also in the one state so we put it on zero state. We can plot it. Looks like this now with our two X gates. Um, and yeah, to uh, like get a better understanding of how it works, it's like an if else in a classical program. Um, just that uh, the qubits are entangled after it. Um, but you can think of it as a if condition. Um, you can play a bit around and set the X gate for the qubits. Okay, uh, I've seen there's a lot of interesting discussions going on. Um, one question that um, I got before is whether we can measure only the first qubit or like uh, on individual qubits. And yes, that's possible. We will take a look into that later. And um, maybe you have also been playing around. You can also visualize your uh, C naught gate with block spheres, of course. So, um, the C naught gate as itself is not uh, producing entanglement. For the entanglement, we first have to bring the qubit. Uh, one qubit into superposition because uh, I mean as you played around with the C0 gate everything you do is deterministic uh, you probably noticed like you have four options uh, that are the outcome so uh, what happens if we put our first uh, qubit you now in a Hadamard uh, state uh, we, we apply a Hadamard gate so it's in a plus state uh, and then we apply our uh, control qubit. Then, uh, in like 50% of all cases, our control gate will um, be applied, and uh, in the other cases, uh, our control qubit would be in the zero state. So we can run this. There's some other nice visualization down here. Uh, you can export your state vector also to latte um, and the reason why we show this state vector here this is now entanglement and there is like uh, no other way to come to this uh, state vector uh, by using a normal uh, application of uh, not gates or like uh, on a classical computer um, so this you can only achieve uh, by uh, using a quantum computer. Here we have uh, how the circuit looks like for the basic uh, entangled state. And here you have the formulas how the state looks like. Okay, and uh, now same exercise as before. Try to play around a bit with the X gate apply the X gate maybe to the control qubit or maybe to the um, controlled to the target qubit uh, and see what changes when you do that. Um, if you just apply it uh, to the control qubit for example oops, this will not uh, significant significantly uh, change your uh, outcome you will see here uh, if you apply an X gate to the uh, control qubit um, it will be just uh, the states will be f uh, flipped but it's uh, it's still the same probabilities for the 1 1 state and the uh, zero, uh, uh, 0 state um, okay, so play around and uh, apply the X gate on the control qubit, on the target qubit. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you should find out now, I think, if you do this. 
you can also get uh, other states. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the question? Oh, ah, I can um, also draw it. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so maybe try a bit uh, what's happening uh, with uh, the gates. Like, you can also maybe try other gates and see what's happening. Uh, and after that, we're going to have a five minutes break. Okay, because we got this question, and also it's the last section of the notebook. Um, why can't we visualize uh, the entangled state on the block sphere? Um, this answer can be found in the slides from the lecture in the morning. So when you take a look at how the Bloch sphere is visualized, um, there's uh, you're taking the cosine of phi and um, at theta and phi of uh, your qubit, and as soon as your qubits are entangled, this is not longer just the phi and theta of one single qubit, but rather it would be for a fully uh, entangled state. So this is why you unfortunately cannot visualize uh, the entangled state uh, with Bloch spheres. Um, that's ex essentially what we are having in this last cell of this tutorial. Um, it's just about to show that this uh, entangled state is uh, not possible to be represented on the Bloch sphere if you tried that during uh, playing around. Are there any questions? It says like the reduced state. Um, <laughs> a state would be a vector. A, a pure state is a vector. Um, there's another thing which we won't go through here called a mixed state. Uh, and that you can represent with matrices. So that's why it's called a state, I think. But yeah. it is the trace or something. Uh, the mixed states are essentially living in the inside of the Bloch sphere. So uh, we have this normalization uh, to put the states on the uh, surface of the, of the sphere. These are the allowed states. But then there's uh, a lot of uh, other states you can have with mixed states. Maybe there is somebody with a physics background, or maybe Nicholas, you can <laughs> explain this like in a break. Q0 and Q1. So can we still draw two major black black boxes? Or well, actually, we have to, we must do the measurement all together. Because, for example, if I only draw a black box on the qubit zero, actually the qubit one is also determined. That's the meaning of entanglement, so right? Mm -hmm. so do we still have the ability to do two separate measurements? Uh, I mean, you could uh, you could still just measure one qubit and do some stuff with the other qubit. Um, and that's actually what we are going to use in the next uh, notebook. Uh, if you want to uh, have that kind of state where the second qubit is uh, in a state where you can re factor the state. Um, it's going to be a bit apparent when we are uh, taking a look at the quantum teleportation. So yes. May I understand that this is just a, it doesn't mean that we have two different uh, measurement, independent measurement. You just say, okay, I read the, the probability from Q0 and another probability from Q1, but it doesn't say about they are two independent me uh, measurements. Right. May I understand that? Mm, this is two independent measurements, yeah. Uh, but, uh, of course, the state is determined as soon as you measure the first one, yes. Thank you. Okay, then let's have like uh, five minutes uh, just uh, walking, uh, standing up, maybe you want to take fresh air, and then we continue on the last uh, notebook. Uh, at, um, let's say... Uh, five to uh, five before half, yeah. Okay, welcome back. Um, so now we're starting our last block. We're 
a bit late on time, but I think we can manage to quickly get through the whole notebook. Um, but we first let's maybe start with some explanation about entanglement. So Nicholas will explain and also uh, look at the bell states because there was a question in the breaks. So uh, entanglement for us sort of simply means that the state of one of the qubits is no longer independent from the first one. So what we can see here is that if we were to perform a measurement on the first state, if this would appear in a zero state, then we would immediately know it, what the measurement of the second state would be. If we measure zero here, then we will always know that the second one will also be zero. If we measure one, it will always be one. Right. The same is true for the other ones. If you measure zero here, you know that this will be one. If you measure one, you know it will be zero. So this, in some sense, is what entanglement is, that things are no longer independent of each other. If you have, for example, this state where you can find it either in zero, 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 one, then it's not entangled. Because if you measure the first one, you have no information about the second one. The second one can be in either zero or in one. So entanglement for us is simply if you know something about the first one, you will also know about the second one. They're not independent. And this is a quantum phenomenon. It's that they are correlated. Is it any okay. clearer <laughs> what entanglement is? Okay. Okay. That's good because that's also a prerequisite for the next uh, uh, notebook. Uh, we are talking about uh, quantum teleportation, and that's like uh, essentially the. We we also look at an application which could be, for example, in uh, uh, key generation, quantum uh, crypt cryptography, and uh, key generation. Uh, so we are looking at a circuit where uh, uh, sender Alice uh, wants to uh, send a secret uh, quantum state to a receiver Bob. And let's take a look how this uh, is implemented. Okay, we, we go step by step. Uh, it's uh, four steps. So in the first step we have uh, Alice that wants to uh, share a secret state. So what we are doing, like before, when we initialized our circuit with a certain state, we are taking uh, the state vector for Alice's secret state. We need a circuit with uh, three qubits. If we want to share more, uh, more bit uh, of a key string, it would increase the number, of course. Uh, and we have to... Uh, entangle the um, ancillary qubits here. We're talking about an ancillary qubit if it's like a helper qubit. And um, we can run it and see here like these qubits down here, they're now entangled. And on our first qubit, we have our uh, secret uh, state that uh, Alice selected before. Any questions uh, so far? It's like a, a key exchange protocol. Okay, now in the second step, we entangle as well uh, the qubit where Alice put her secret key with one of the uh, two entangled qubits, like the uh, second qubit here. Uh, by the way, because we had this uh, question about the barriers, so here it makes no sense to put the barriers, these uh, vertical uh, lines to just separate uh, the steps in our algorithm. They don't uh, do anything like a measurement or they don't destruct uh, anything in this circuit. So now we have the first, uh, in the first step we had like these qubits entangled, now we have also these qubits entangled. So indirectly the first qubit is also entangled with the uh, second one. So in the next step, 
Uh, and that also to answer the question whether we always have to read out on all qubits uh, to a classical bit. Um, here you can see we have our unknown state. We have uh, we initialize it with our um, with our, our secret state, and we create a quantum uh, register. Uh, this is a, a, the quantum register is uh, like the qubits that we are using. So in this case, we need the three qubits, like Alice qubit, and these two entangled, and then one of these entangled will become Bob's qubit. And then we can also add a so-called classical register. In Qiskit, it's called classical register. It's uh, a classical bit, which we write the values that we are reading. And we have two classical registers with uh, one bit. And our quantum circuit would be initialized like this. So we have our qubits and our classical bits. We initialize it with uh, the state from Alice uh, key. That's now the first step was to entangle these uh, two qubits. With a barrier, we entangle the other qubits and then we measure uh, the first two qubits on our two classical registers. And that looks like this. Okay, are there questions so far? So all the qubits are entangled. We measure the first uh, first two qubits. The uh, qubit, uh, this second qubit and the third qubit, they are um, they are uh, initialized with a zero state, and on the other we apply this uh, state phi. Yes. I have a question. So, if we measure qubit zero and qubit one, so can we perform uh, the following quantum calculations on qubit two? If we went measure first two qubits, so can we just uh, yes. make additional gates on the qubit two and perform the calculations? As yes. It never happens. <laughs> yes. Uh, essentially, that's what we want to do. Uh, that's how the algorithm is designed. So, um, because we have some uh, previous knowledge about how the qubits are entangled, we kind of know uh, the information uh, on the qubit 2. And that's now the last step in our um, encryption protocol to um, take the classical bits from our belt state that we measured before and uh, encode it on the last qubit. We can absolutely do that. And now the uh, secret uh, state from Alice will be projected on the X and Z axis. So we can read it and um, on the last qubit there will be our state that we had oops that we had uh, in this violet uh, uh, gate over there those um, yes if we uh, if we receive a zero we would not put the gate. If we receive a 1, we would put the gate. Uh, and same for this one. Yes. Uh, and of course, there. Um, yeah. So, does it mean the speed of light? It's not actual teleportation because we measure it classically and then uh, make operations uh, controlled of classical qubits. Uh, we, we need the wire. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, we... Um, you need to okay. communicate the two classical bits. Yes. Of course. Y you have to communicate the classical bits, yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course you have to kind of find a way 
to entangle these uh, qubits over here and make sure that uh, one uh, of them is at Bob's place and one is at Alice's place. So if you want to practically implement that, you would have to, let's say, uh, build a quantum memory, uh, entangle this first part and then move the second qubit far away. Uh, and then you have like a reservoir of qubits that are entangled, which you can then use uh, to uh, use your limited to the number of qubit amount of uh, teleportations. Because of course, after you measure the second qubit, it will be also um, uh, not entangled anymore. Okay. Thank you. Um, there are actually physical implementations on um, how to do this uh, coupling step here. This is uh, this is a decoupling gate uh, in a, in a quantum computer. When you want to implement this in a physical hardware, you would uh, need a coupling gate between the two qubits, and uh, there are experiments in. Um, uh, in China, they already have a line from Beijing to uh, Guangzhou. Uh, and in uh, the Netherlands, in Delft, they are also having some, some of the Netherlands or Dutch uh, universities are connected already. I think we also have a connection or uh, there's planned in between uh, Alto and KTH. Uh, so, uh, so this is kind of a, uh, let's say, quantum internet where you have where you send uh, where you kind of uh, you you implement your coupling gate by sending a laser over far distance and then you can uh, entangle two qubits that are not on the same uh, fridge not on the same laboratory uh, and of course, there are already also like quantum men in the middle attacks if anybody is in cybersecurity or uh, <laughs> uh, these topics. Okay. Um, are there questions? This is now a fairly complex algorithm. Um, or like uh, if you started looking into the topic since today it's probably fairly complex and overwhelming uh, but during the next days um, some of the uh, other algorithms may be probably built on this um, but the um, general concept it's clear to everybody we uh, entangle the qubits encode on the first measure on the classical and uh, depending on this state we uh, can read out the last qubit are there questions in the uh, HackMD? Okay, so if not, um, then we are done with the tutorials and we are actually in time. Um, so if you have any questions, you can uh, always come to us and uh, to the other lecturers. Um, and then I wish a nice uh, evening. I can't join for the social event because I have an exam, but uh, we see each other tomorrow uh, in the lab course. Yeah. <laughs>